episode seven of What's Tom Reading. I'm Tom, and today I'm talking about the book How to Invent Everything, A Survival Guide for the Stranded Time Traveler by Ryan North. Thanks for listening. Enjoy the show. Right, so as I said, today I am talking about this nonfiction kind of ish book called How to Invent Everything A Survival Guide for the Stranded Time Traveler by Ryan North. And this, if you remember me talking about it last week, or if you listened, or not last week, last episode, I guess, kind of like I said before, I'm reading these books faster than I'm recording these podcasts. Um, so I'm recording this before I've even released the one previously about Vikings. So. <clears throat> I'm kind of getting ahead of myself, but I'm hoping to give myself a little bit of a cushion. Um, I've been living through midterms, um, some exams and some pretty tough classes over the last week or so. And I just finished and I'm really excited. And so I want to like get back on the horse and finish. I, I mean, I finished a couple of books this week that were just awesome. So I'm talking about this book. It's nonfiction kind of the premise of it is fictional and actually very cool actually it's one of my favorite parts of the book but before i jump into that i wanted to tell you a little bit about the author his name is ryan north um and a lot of times i'll just jump over to the wikipedia page here because you know i'm, I'm not above using wikipedia for information um I'll save you a, a google <laughs> um but he's a canadian writer and computer programmer um he's written a bunch of comic books and uh yeah just has an interesting life he's really funny um his picture on wikipedia is a picture of him next to his dog who's named gnome chomp ski like gnome chomp ski yeah, that's pretty funny um i promise the jokes in the book are better than that one um, but yeah they the author is really funny he writes this book and i guess let me tell you about the premise of the book so that we can kind of establish ourselves here right off the bat. So the premise here is that you are, you the reader are um, reading a manual that is, <clears throat> that was on board your time machine um, that has broken down. And so basically you come from the future, some distant point in the future where we've invented time travel. You went back in time to visit the past. It's not, it's like a non-linear time travel kind of world that he has going on here where like the butterfly effect isn't a thing. Like if you step on a butterfly, it's not gonna, it's not gonna, you know, cause the end of the world sometime in the future. It's basically, um, yeah, basically you go back in time and then you just create a new timeline where you went back in time and your old timeline is gone um, or uh, you dissolve and destroy the future timelines of all of the other people who are in your your current timeline. Um, the ethical implications are pretty are pretty uh, intense <laughs> in this form of time travel. I, I personally prefer the, the linear time travel um, theory where like you you go back in time, you got to be really, really careful not to, you know, accidentally uh, cause the death of your own grandfather or something like that. And then you end up disappearing or whatever. I like that style. It, it, it uh, makes for a much more rich and cautious time travel experience, but it would not work at all for this book because the whole point of this book is that you went back in time for some entertainment purpose, maybe to see dinosaurs or see, you know, humanity emerge from, uh, you know, the caveman era or something like that. And you have somehow broken your time machine. And so you're reading this manual that says what to do if your time machine is broken. And basically it starts off by saying, sorry, you can't fix your time machine. Um, but here are just a ton of useful facts and technologies that you can use to rebuild civilization and not just rebuild it, but to build it better, faster, um, you know, here's here's a leg up on all the technology that you now don't have access to because you're stuck in the past somewhere, presumably before these technologies existed. Um, and so you're going to have to rebuild it. And so this book, to me, I will admit right off the bat is like it's like crack to me, um, uh, uh, not small part of me reads books to try and learn as much as I can kind of on this imaginary premise that like, if I had to know it, if I had to know this information, 
um, in order to like rebuild something or, or to, to, you know, accomplish something or to colonize Mars or whatever my, my little fantasy is at the time. Um, if I had to know these things, what things would I like to know? And it, this book, when I found it, I was like, oh man, this is like right up my alley. This is exactly what I want to hear. Uh, and so, um, it, it just goes through a list of just basic conventions, like, <clears throat> like bronze smelting, um, and, and you know, how to build kilns, how to, um, fire clay for bricks. It goes through like really basic technologies, even like how to tan leather. Um, and so it, it basically takes you from a, like you're, you're stuck living in a world where like, it's just a bunch of proto humans and you with this manual, where do you start? Um, and he even starts talking about like how to make fire, how to, um, how to, you know, build shelter, how to, uh, like I said, tan hides. He doesn't go into any detail about skinning an animal or anything like that. But, you know, if you need any, ever need any help with something like that or some details on that, let me know. Uh, I worked in a butcher shop for a little while. I, I know my way around an animal hide. Um, random piece of information about me, I guess. <laughs> but yeah, uh, he, he talks about like, all the different basic proto technologies and then works his way gradually up to like and or gates in a logical computer. Right. So everything in between powered flight, uh, unpowered gliding, um, hot air balloons, um, sailing both with a square sails and with a four aft triangular sail, which I found extremely fascinating how to navigate um, with and without compasses, how to invent compasses, basically just how to invent all of the things that are going to be kind of the foundational inventions that you're going to need in order to rebuild society. And I freaking, I loved this book. I, I seriously, I could not put it down. Um, it was exactly um, every time I'd get to about the point where I'd be like, okay, I'm kind of bored with this. Um, I, he would move on to a different subject and I'd be like, yes, okay, new, fresh thing to learn about. And it was like, I, I mean, if I, if I have a complaint, it's that it was too short. If I'm honest, <laughs> like this book was awesome. And I would have really, really enjoyed like a more thorough uh, deep dive into like how to build engines and the different components of the engines. Cause that's something that I'll probably end up reading a book about at some point. And I might not include it in the podcast um, because uh, as my wife has informed me very gently and lovingly, torque converters are not interesting to anyone except for me and people who are interested in torque converters probably know about them. So I'd be, I'd be preaching to a really, really niche audience there of people who um, are open to learning about torque converters, but don't already know about it. So, um, uh, and I fall in that niche audience, but I don't know how many of you out there do. Maybe just let me know, you know, if you, if you think it'd be a good idea for me to go and review a book on, um, <clears throat> how to build an engine from scratch, then maybe, uh, maybe I'll do that. But otherwise I'll probably just stick to, um, books that are a little bit more, uh, you know, interesting to a little bit larger group of people. But anyways, this book, um, it, it just covers everything. And the best part of it is that it covers everything interestingly. And with like a good amount of like almost laugh out loud humor, like it was really funny. Um, most of the time, uh, the jokes land really well. Uh, and I really liked that. And the premise of it was really entertaining throughout, right? Like, like, um, one thing that the author does is he starts every new chapter with a really famous quote from like Ralph Waldo Emerson or, you know, Muhammad Ali or something like that. But then he attributes the quotes to you quote, like as in the reader and also Muhammad Ali, right? Because the implication is that you're now going to steal these quotes and they'll be attributed to you in your timeline. And he also says that about basically all of the inventions that, uh, <laughs> that that uh you know this was invented by so and so but mostly now it was invented by you and so um it's a really cool and interesting thing that he does and the, the premise of this book i think was was probably my favorite part um because it it really um it really sets up in a narrative form kind of why you would want to know all of these things and what use they would be in a way that I think is really creative and clever. And so uh, I'm a fan, a big fan of this book and you should pick it up. You definitely should add this to your library. This is one of those books that um, I definitely want to own um, and would recommend that you own as like a hard copy because it has a lot of uh, diagrams and illustrations and like, it'll actually show you like how to build these things, right? Like, um, 
you know, if you ever want to build a spinning wheel or for some reason, like, like to spin yarn or whatever, um, there's diagrams on how to do that and, and what the different parts are and how they fit together. And there's different things throughout the book that are really, really interesting. Um, and so this is a book that I would recommend, uh, going and picking up like a hard copy of, Oh, and a reminder, um, if you want to buy this book, please use the link that I have in the description. It's my Amazon affiliate link. It doesn't cost you anything extra. And if you buy the book and uh, it ships out to you, then Amazon will give me a few pennies for telling you about the book, which is something that I want because I want I want to be able to buy more books. Yeah. Um, and you'd be supporting the podcast and supporting my uh, book habit. And that would be just swell. So if you decide you want to pick up this book, go ahead and use my link to, to pick it up on Amazon. Um, it's, uh, it's not much, but it, everything, uh, helps and is greatly appreciated. And so, yeah, um, things I liked about this book now that we're really clear on the premise and I've already talked about some of the things that I like, but some of the things that I really liked about this book, um, were the care that the author took in the ordering of the different technologies, right? Like he, he mostly doesn't jump around to different random technologies. I think it was really cool that he, uh, basically assumed that you were starting from scratch, having to build a society from nothing. And then each, inve each invention kind of builds off of the other. Right. Um, and he, he throughout the different times, he kind of um, puts, uh, I guess, things that happened in the past into a modern perspective. And that's, you know, that's not useful. And in fact, I'll maybe talk a little, little bit more about that as something that I didn't like as much about this book. Um, but he, you know, a lot of times he mocks uh, our ancestors for being unable to <clears throat> implement these technologies earlier than they did. Um, a good example would be like, we had the ability to create human flight in the form of a hot air balloon, um, like 200,000 years ago, probably, right? Like we had fire, we had fabric, um, that's all you need for a hot air balloon and nobody did it until like, like many, many, many moons later. Uh, and they weren't really used properly until like around the same time as the American civil war, right? Like these, these were, um, there's a lot of times in history where there are just kind of low hanging fruit that nobody picks. Um, but I don't think that's particularly fair because I mean, our ancestors had other things to worry about, like, uh, you know, bubonic plague and, uh, getting chopped up by swords of Vikings from our last pod podcast, uh, and, you know, trying to survive a harsh winter without, you know, central heating and canned foods or whatever, right? Like these guys, they had to, uh, they had to endure a lot, our ancestors. And I don't really think it's very fair or funny, um, to, to imply that they are a bunch of lazy dum dums, uh, which the author does all the time. And uh, yeah, uh, let me save this for the things I didn't like because I want to be able to actually, for the first time, tell you some significant material things that I did not like about this book. And they were kind of some doozies, if I'm if I'm honest. Um, and if you know me by now, which I think most of you do, if you're listening to this, you kind of know where I where I'm going to have some beef. Um, and it's in it's in the academia stuff. You know, I know, I know, I know I'm just banging the same drum every episode. But bear with me on this one, because there's I think I think there's some good points here. But things that I did like about this book, like I said, the order. I loved the humor. I loved um the selection of inventions, I think they were very useful, every one of them. There's none of them that I was like, eh, that's not really something you'd want to include. Um, you know, he talks about um, how to feed yourself, you know, how to how to pickle things, how to, you know, how to brine things, how to um, preserve things by salting them. Um, you know, the food preservation is a big one. Uh, plant cultivation is a big one. The domestication of dogs is a big one, right? And I didn't know, like, there was a lot of information here that he gives you some background on, like how the original inventor came up with it and then how you could do it yourself um, faster or better or make some shortcuts, uh, you know, not make some of the same mistakes. Um, and, you know, you could domesticate a wolf into a dog in about 18 years, right? Um, obviously not the same wolf, but like it's descendants. You could have the, you could have yourself a dog in, you know, around 18 years, which is super, super cool. And so the, it made me want to try a lot of the stuff that he talked about, like tanning leather. Um, it sounds like the grossest thing ever. Like you gotta like, so you skin the animal and then you put salt on the, um, on the, animal side of the hide, not the, not the hair side I'm on the inside of the hide, I should say, put salt on it. And so it dries out and you leave it out in the sun until it gets good and crispy, um, and dry. And then 
Um, you scrape off all of the nyanyes <clears throat> on the, you know, all the salt and stuff. Then you dip it in pee, just soak it in pee, um, human pee if you want, animal pee if you can get it. Um, just soak the hides in pee, and then the uric acid in your pee will loosen the hair. And then you uh, pull it out of the pee after a few days and scrape off all the hair and scrape off all of like the fascia and yanyas and stuff on the inside of the hide. And then you'll still have kind of a crispy, gross, soggy pee smelling pee soaked hide. Um, and the next step is arguably grosser even than that, if you can imagine. Um, and that's to take just a bunch of animal poop, cow works just fine, and um, mix it into a slurry with some water and then drop the hide into it and then get into the tub with the hides that you've scraped from your pee um, and then just like squish and squish, squish, squish the hides into the poo slurry. And then the enzymes in the poo there, they'll kind of like break down um, some of the... Um, I guess cellular makeup of the animal hide and replace it. Um, it'll also like bring in moisture that won't rot, and it'll also um, it'll it'll just kind of make it water resistant. It'll make it so that it holds water, but it's going to be like a poo bag. Um, and so, yeah, just just do that until it's nice and pliable and pooey, and then you bring it out and you wash it and dry it, and that's your leather. You got some nice supple uh, tanned leather. Oh, I, I, I mix I missed a step there um, that is extremely critical <laughs> because otherwise you would just have like poo soaked cow skin. Um, <laughs> no, uh, you need tannins and you need them from from wood. Uh, that's where the, that's where tanning comes from. See, see, you know, it's a good thing that I read this book and uh, I apologize if you were listening along and you got all the way to this step. Uh, but, yeah, you do need tannins and you mix that in with the poo slurry as well. And the way you get those is um, hardwoods like oak or ash, um, you you burn them and then you collect their ashes and then you steep their ashes in water and boil them off and then you do you boil off the water a couple of times and that'll dilute a more and more uh, tannin rich solution and these tannins are toxic so don't you know eat them or breathe them or touch them but then just like toss them into your poo slurry a good amount of them um and then just as you're as you're kneading your your hides with your feet um pretending that you're squeezing grapes as the author says um then these tannins get worked into the hide and the tannins are what make it waterproof and replace um the different molecules um with, with uh non-rotting uh, waterproof molecules. That's that's how tanning works. Um, critically, you need tannins for that. And that's that's my bad. That's my bad, you guys. Um, <laughs> uh, sorry about that. If you, yeah, like I said, um, we're following along. So yeah, that, that's one of the things that I really liked. I also liked the, the part on sailing, learning how to tack into the wind. Um, that's something I've always been curious about. And you need a triangular fore and aft sail, right? Um, and the way that that works is that uh, you've got you've got a boom on your sail. Most most of you probably know what a sailboat looks like, and if you don't, then Google it. Right, it's a triangular sail where the mast is kind of forward on the ship, and the boom kind of goes backwards. Right, and the boom um, you can move side to side, and that'll affect the angle that the wind hits the sail in. And if you do it right, then you can actually not only get the wind to push the sail, but you can get the wind that's passing over the sail to generate lift like the wing of an airplane. And so it's possible actually for people to sail not only against the wind at a 45 degree angle, right, and then zigzag back and forth, that's tacking, so you can effectively sail into the wind. Um, but it allows you to sail with the wind at 1.5 times the speed of the wind because of the lift of the lift that's generated over the wing foil of your sail. So that's just a super cool um, thing that I didn't really know much about at all. Uh, it also talks about how to like, you know, what a keel is for on, on your ship. And that's a big vertical board that's uh, attached to the bottom of your boat. And that kind of acts as like a like a ballast at the bottom in the water that so that you don't tip over um, with your sail. So, and also so that when the sail catches air, it pushes your boat forward rather than like pushing it sideways on the surface of the water. Right. So you need a kind of a, a deeper keel and you need a rudder and you need to, you know, these sails, but you know, <laughs> these technologies were not super hard to make. And so you can imagine if you were back in time and you had to come up with these things, just like the massive, massive difference that you could make in your little society there, just by having some of these inventions. Um, I think it's just 
just so cool. It's such a cool idea for a book. And it really made my imagination run wild. And I learned a ton about a ton of different things, which is the reason that I, that I read. Um, and so this book, this book hit me right in all of the right ways, except for a couple, which I'm going to talk about here after I'm done with the corners. Um, and that's probably good for the things that I liked about this book. Let's move over now to the science corner. Let's go. Okay, folks, so welcome to the Science Corner. And I, I should have said so earlier in the podcast, but if it sounds like I'm a little bit snuffly or if you catch me sniffing at all, I'll try to avoid doing that in the microphone um, because it makes an annoying sound. But if I sound a little snuffly, it's because um, everyone in my family has colds. We have been tested. We It is just a cold. So um, if, if you can detect something in my voice there, that's what it is. But in today's Science Corner, I am talking about something that is a little bit gross and a little bit weirdly close to me right now. That's uh, because I'm looking at it right this second, and that is the giant water bug, uh, sometimes called or used to be called the Indian toe biter. I don't know if that is a politically correct term to use for it now, but it's the giant water bug or Lethocerus americanus. And uh, I found one of these in the parking lot near my house, um, and I freaked out a little bit. I had never seen anything like this bug. And I'm a person who loved bugs as a kid. I freaking, I thought I knew actually kind of an above average amount about bugs, but I had never seen anything like this before. I thought it was a literal alien. And then I was like, is that a, is that an alien? Is it a scorpion? Is that like a, like, what is that thing? It's the weirdest, weirdest bug. Um, and if you haven't seen one before, then congratulations, you're just like me. But look it up. This bu this bug is, it's huge. It, it can be like the size of like a dude's hand. And the one that we've got is maybe about the size, it's about as long as my fingers. Um, and so I captured it and I put it in this little bottle because it turns out that I, before I knew about this, I didn't realize that they have an exceptionally painful bite. Um, and so that's something that that I later learned and was like, oh, I maybe should have been a little bit more careful with that. These things are huge and they eat like frogs and fish and like other large bugs. Uh, and the way that they eat them is so they have these legs that are attached to the front of their face in a really, really weird way. And I got to tell you guys, when I picked up this bug, I was shocked at how strong it was. Like I could feel it like flopping around on my hands. It felt like I was picking up like a little animal, like a mouse or something like that. It was a really, really strong insect. And what it does is it, it floats there. It looks kind of like a leaf and it floats in the water and it waits until a fish or a frog swims close to it. And then it grabs onto it with its hands, pulls it close to its mouth, and then it injects it with this rostrum. It's like a big straw thing, a big, sharp hypodermic straw, only it's huge. Um, and it jabs that in there and injects it with saliva. And then that saliva just decomposes and digests the its prey from the inside and then it just slurps it up through its little straw like a milkshake and i watched a youtube video of a dude getting bit by one of these things and he like cried he was w rolling around on the floor sweating and crying and talking about how it was like one of the most painful things that he'd ever experienced i was like oh boy and i have that in a little hawaiian punch bottle now um it turns out they actually make pretty good pets and so we're gonna try and keep it for a little while my daughter is obsessed with bugs we are uh exercising safety with it and we're also exercising all due um, precautions to make sure that this animal is being treated humanely and not cruelly. Um, and we're going to start feeding it some crickets tomorrow. And hopefully, uh, hopefully it likes its new little home. We're going to maybe get a, a tank for it or something. I don't know. We'll see how it goes. Um, or we'll just set it free. But it's getting kind of late in the season. And this uh, this old girl here was very, very far away from a body of water. So I don't really know um, if she was going to survive where I found her. She, it just seems kind of weird, actually, that she was there. I don't know if somebody lost her or what. Um, like I said, I've never seen a bug like this, but they're usually supposed to be by bodies of water. And that's not where I found her. And um, so, you know, maybe we can give her a good life here in our little uh, back room aquarium or something like that. We'll see. We'll find out. But if you haven't already, look up this giant water bug because these things are freaking uh, scary. They're like the wildest, weirdest little animals. And that's it for the science corner. I didn't want to like do anything on theme um, for this book because everything in this book is science. And so, yeah. I thought maybe I'll just step away. Um, I hope you'll forgive me for that. And also this, this bug is right next to me and it's just like flailing against the side of the fruit punch thing with his gross head arms. And it's, I can like hear it clack, clack, clacking in there. And it's, it's really freaking me out. So look up this bug, watch some video of it moving around. It's powerful. It's freaky. It's weird. Uh, anyways, this is the science corner. Let's go to the history corner. All 
All right. So the history corner, I'm going to keep a little bit vague for the sake of um, um, kind of letting you, dear reader, if you haven't already, go and experience this rabbit hole yourself because it is a profound thing. Um, and, and I don't want to spoil it for you. But basically, this book that I'm reading or that I finished reading on uh, how to invent everything, it kind of implies and jokes a number of different times that um, somehow one of their books went back in time and fell into the hands of Leonardo da Vinci. And that's why he had um, <laughs> he had like diagrams of a bunch of things that he should definitely not have known anything about. But if you would like just to, to spend a really fascinating hour, maybe hour and a half of an afternoon somewhere where you don't have that much else to do, look up Leonardo da Vinci and look at the things that he invented or like the things that he not like he didn't actually invent or create, but that he diagrammed like this guy. Um, diagrammed helicopters. He diagrammed airplanes. He diagrammed tanks. Um, he invented just a ton of different things. Uh, and I don't want to spoil any of it for you um, because this is kind of a science slash history thing. But this book really mentioned that a number of times. And as someone who has spent some time looking at Da Vinci's kind of weird uh, things that he probably shouldn't have known about, uh, it, this is definitely worth your time. Go and actually Google Leonardo Da Vinci's inventions and, and kind of dig through it. Or I guess if not Google, then whatever you're preferred search engine is i know google's on the outs with some people right now so go and search on the internet for leonardo da vinci's um inventions and then just see what this guy came up with it's wild particularly given the time that he lived and so yeah that has been the history corner let's move over to the random corner All right, so welcome to the Random Corner. In the spirit of the invention motif that this book has uh, brought to the table uh, for this episode, I wanted to talk about kind of a random invention that was made just by accident. Um, and it's one that you're definitely familiar with, but if you know the origin story of this invention, then uh, kudos to you. But um, the slinky, the slinky, the toy that is just a bunch of coiled wire and it slinks and rolls and bounces and bobs around. That was invented by the Navy. Now, what was the Navy trying to do? Well, I'm glad you asked. Uh, this naval engineer was trying to design a meter in order to monitor power on battleships. Um, and as he was going, he was working with these springs um, that look a lot like the slinky, uh, the, the, their tension springs, right? And so you stretch them out um, and then... If you, as you know, with a slinky, if you stretch it out and then let it go, it'll spring back. Um, so rather than springing out like a spring, it actually will spring back to a smaller size. That's a tension spring, right? And what he noticed is that when he dropped one to the ground, it just kept kind of bouncing around and rolling around. And it, it basically walked off. And he was like, oh my gosh, I have to call the Pentagon. And the Pentagon was like, yeah, this is a sweet toy for kids, man. Great job. And then the Slinky was born. And I don't know if that guy, that naval engineer, got to keep credit for it or if the United States Navy is still um, funding its overseas operations on Slinky sales. But, you know, I'd like to think the latter. I, I really would. Uh, this has been The Random Corner. We're going back to the main review. All right, guys. So we are back in the main review now, and I'm going to apologize up front if you've noticed a uh, sudden change in the sound quality. Um, I am now using an extremely sensitive condenser microphone to try and record this, and I'm going to try really hard to mind my literal P's and Q's because the P, P, P sound uh, can come through extremely strongly on this microphone. The reason I had to switch is because one of my uh, children decided to take my podcast recording microphone and destroy it, just utterly maul and crush and dismantle this microphone as uh, toddlers are wont to do. If you have a toddler, you know what I'm talking about. If you don't, um, then uh, good luck to you at whatever time in your future you happen to deal with a toddler. They are uh, basically monsters. And speaking of monsters, um, I, uh, I'm recording the second half of the podcast. And I understand how disorienting that can be, but I'm recording this on a different day. Um, partially because my microphone was destroyed and I had to come up with a different solution. Um, but I am looking at <clears throat> this giant water bug that I mentioned in the science corner. I'm looking at it right now and I have an update on this thing. Uh, it's a monster. It's a literal, uh, disgusting, hideous creature. Um, I, so my daughter loves it. My daughters love it. Um, 
They've named it Lily, um, which is too good of a name for too pretty of a name for a creature like this. Uh, it, it's a disgusting, hideous beast, as I said. Um, and it's flailing around in its little tank right now because it just finished um, eating a cricket. So I, I went out to the pet store this morning, well, this morning and bought some uh, some crickets for this uh <laughs> giant water bug to eat and uh, we dropped a couple in there at first she didn't seem interested in them just kind of swimming around the crickets actually climbed up onto her back to get out of the water and then she just snatched one of them in her hideous monstrously strong uh four limbs and pressed it up against her mouth and plunged her extremely sharp powerful rostrum needle thing into it and injected it with digestive enzymes and it drank the whole thing like a milkshake and now there's a hollowed out nasty cricket floating in this bottle next to her and the other cricket is just looking at her like oh boy I may have made a mistake on climbing onto you and she's uh she hasn't started eating him yet but um I mean, she's sizing him up for sure. I think she's just waiting until she's uh, feeling a little bit more peckish later. But man, um, nature is uh, is brutal. Watching this cricket be eaten alive from the inside. Um, well, you know, it just made me grateful that I'm uh, a little higher up the food chain, to be honest, and that we're not dealing with giant, uh, giant giant water bugs that, that are big enough to eat me. Um, I did a little more research on this creature. Turns out that it is known to eat ducklings um, <laughs> and, and frogs and snakes and everything like that as well. Uh, so crickets, you know, a, a, a little bit of a morsel for her, um, but she seems fine for now. But ooh, I'm, lo I'm looking at Lily and she's looking at me and uh, I can tell she's planning something. So I'm going to keep uh, her lid on tight there. But anyways, we are back to the main review here. I apologize for that long, uh, rambling kind of, uh, diversion, but, uh, this thing is just super real to me right now. And I wanted to give you guys an update on that. So, um, this part of the review is, as you know, the part where I talk a little bit about the things that I didn't like so much about this book. And I have to preface this as I always do by saying, overall, I loved the book. I really, really did. I thought it was uh, really thoughtful, really thoughtfully written, really creative, uh, a super creative premise, um, that, that I really have a lot of respect for because it's, um, uh, you know, writing a book about useful inventions could be really dry to a lot of people, but framing it in the context of like, uh, you are a stranded time traveler. Very, very cool. Very good idea. Very good way to do that. Props to the author for that. Absolutely. So it is with that background, um, and that little bit of dissembling that I must now proceed to the things that I did not like about the book. And naturally, that means that I'm going to have to be a little bit critical of the author here. And I, I just have to say, um, the thing I didn't like about this book was arrogance. And it's ironically kind of a temporal arrogance, right? So um, a lot of talking about how stupid our ancestors are and not a lot of self-recognition on uh, the fact that we are probably stupid to our descendants, right? Like, uh, you know, however many years into the future, people look back at our time. They're probably going to think that some of the stuff that we do is dumb, even though we certainly don't think that it is. Um, there was also some like, uh, just like annoying ideological stuff, like just annoying political stuff as well, where he's like, um, I, I don't want to get into too many details. You know, I don't want to lose any friends over politics or whatever. Um, well, I mean, I don't mind doing that in my private life so much, but, um, for this podcast, I, I've just tried to just try to keep it politically neutral. Although, uh, the next book where I'm talking about, uh, uh, family that, uh, or, yeah, a guy and his family that were destroyed by the uh, Chinese communist party. I think you might get a little bit more, uh, politics out of me on that one, but, and I'm almost done with that book as well. But as far as, um, most things go, I'm going to try to remain as politically neutral as possible because I just don't think it's very helpful. And, you know, I'm, I'm willing to, um, live with the idea that I might be just completely wrong about everything that I think. So, um, this author though, on the other hand, was not willing to do that. He, um, he seems very, very, very confident, uh, in his own political beliefs that they will, uh, go down in history, uh, into the, you know, however many hundreds of years into the future that this, this book is supposedly being written. Um, he, he believes that those ideas will still, uh, hold strong and hold water. I, 
on the other hand, feel quite strongly that they will not. I think they're going to a lot of the ideas that he espouses um, and I won't say which ones, but I think they're going to end up kind of on the dung heap of history. They're going to be one of those things that people look back on and like, eh, maybe not as cool or as good of an idea as people thought they were at the time. Um, so there's, there's some of that. And basically, you know, it's kind of ironic because, um, you know, this guy has, he seems to be of a a certain uh, type of persuasion where he he feels like, um, he takes, so he takes a lot of, a lot of opportunities to just dump on Europe for some reason. I, I don't understand why that's so trendy nowadays. Like I get the colonialism bad and all that stuff. Right. Um, but like, he he takes every opportunity to discredit uh, Europeans and European philosophy and European inventors even, and just be like, well, a Chinese person probably did it first, right? Um, he, that's the caveat he gives on everything that we have recorded as coming from Europe and just like constantly throughout the book. It's just to the point where it's just really tedious and obnoxious, just like, like, um, well, it was invented by a Chinese person, but a European, like a European person put their name on it, right? Like, yeah, okay, cool, right? Um, but like, if we don't know the name of the Chinese person and we do know the name of the European person, that's why we name, you know, the Bernoulli principle after a guy named Bernoulli, right? It's not because we didn't want to give credit to the Chinese inventor. Like maybe it's just that that was not recorded. I don't know specifically, but it just kind of gets old, right? Like if we're going to be appreciating history and all of history's inventions, we should really take, um, we should really take care to, um, show respect and admiration for all peoples and places that did cool things that, that provided inventions that are useful to us today. That's our common human heritage. And it it's really super, super lame for us to look back at any particular group of people. And even though it's, you know, politically fancy right now to say that the Europeans were just the worst, um, they weren't at the time. They were just trying to live their best life, trying to survive off of, you know, really difficult circumstances, just like everybody else in the history of humanity. So kind of obnoxious, kind of a pain in the butt. I really don't want like when authors engage in that type of thing. And in in a way, it's kind of like um, it's kind of its own intellectual colonialism, right? Like you're going back and co-opting the ideas of others who have gone before in other places and times and imprinting your own values on the things that they did, right? It's ethnocentric. It's kind of bogus. And it's also sort of ironic because in his attempts to avoid ethnocentrism or give the, you know, the veneer of avoiding ethnocentrism, as most people are want to do rather than actually, you know, doing any material work um, in order to avoid the veneer of ethnocentrism. This guy has behaved ethnocentrically. Right. And, you know, like, haha, people are hypocrites. Big surprise, big whoop. I get it. You're probably annoyed at me for moaning about this, but it's just a pet peeve of mine when you're talking about history and, and, you know, different groups of people, when people take the opportunity to just take a trendy shot at something that they don't agree with politically and just assume that that's gospel, that their opinion is just like the truth and the gospel and like that it will be the truth forever. I think it's really arrogant. It's really presumptuous. And it's just not true. Like this guy's wrong about stuff that he thinks he's right about for sure. I'm wrong about stuff. I think I'm right about for sure. Like if you have any brain in your head and like you look at any history book and you look at the certainty with which those people approach their life and then you think like, hmm, yeah, well, they were wrong, but I for sure am not, right? Uh, I got news for you. Um, maybe we'll talk about the Dunning-Kruger effect on a different podcast episode in the random corner or something like that. But uh, yeah, it's not looking good for you. You don't know what you don't know. And the more you, <laughs> I mean, the more certain you are, typically, uh, the less you actually know in my experience. So with that said, um, that was the, the, about the only thing that I didn't like about this book, though. So um, you know, all all things considered, like, uh, you know, he did that annoying thing that most annoying people do these days. Um, and, you know, can't blame him. He's a man in his time. Just I mean, I understand the irony of what I'm saying, too. Right. He's just a man in his time trying to live his life, trying to do the best he can with what he's got, uh, trying to fit in, trying to be cool, trying to like get a seat at the cool kids table. I get it. I feel it. Um, it's just I don't know. I wish a little bit more impartiality could be exercised when you're when you're trying to do something that's ostensibly profession professional. Um, but whatever. Right. All good. No problem. No skin off my nose. It's time for me to give this book the uh, amazing, wonderful, ultra, super duper um, massive rating of the bells. Here we go.
That's right, guys. This is a four star book. Um, uh, it's actually probably a three star book. I'm being a little generous with four stars, but that's just because I loved, loved, loved the premise of it. I loved the fact that it included lots of cool inventions. Honestly, though, you would probably have given this three stars. So, uh, yeah, maybe. Uh, I, I got to be careful not to let my grading system get diluted here, right? Because I want a five-star book to really mean something. And you know, I just go around giving everything four stars. But I have to admit, I, I'm a sucker for this format. I'm a sucker for compilations of super cool inventions. So I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick with it. It's four stars. Um, but in my heart of hearts, I have to admit that it's probably actually a three-star book. So uh, we'll, we'll, we'll wrap it up there. But I, I've just realized, you guys, I've forgotten. I've neglected my duty um, to include a lawyer joke with every podcast over the last couple of episodes. And so I wanted to rectify that right now. So here is a lawyer joke. <clears throat> Ready? A man went to a lawyer and asked him what his fee was. $100 for three questions, answered the lawyer. Isn't that a little steep, said the man. Yes, said the lawyer. Now, what's your third question? Get it? Because he asked the fee. Question one. Isn't that a little steep? Yes. Now, what's your third question? That's funny. Lawyers are tight. Lawyer, lawyers are slippery. You got to watch out for them. They'll get you every time. I hope that was funny to you. It was certainly funny to me. Oh, and before I forget, um, thank you all so much for listening to the podcast. I really, really appreciate it. I've gotten awesome feedback from all of you guys. Um, if you like it and, you know, you got a kick out of it, please feel free to um, subscribe to it on whatever um, podcasting service you're using. Please uh, give it a review if that option is available to you. Share it with someone who you think would like it. Whatever we can do to kind of get this um, podcast out there on the algorithm. It's a super competitive market to get podcasts out there. And it, it really means a lot to me um, that you guys are being so supportive. And it's it, it warms my heart to think that somebody out there somewhere is getting something out of this show, this little show that I'm putting together. So um, if you like it, please feel free to share it. I really, really appreciate that. Um, I'm running a promotion right now on my Facebook page. Um, I don't know when you'll hear this, but you can go ahead and check out my Facebook page. It's what's Tom reading. That's on Facebook. You'll see my little books there, head over there, like the page and then follow the instructions and you'll kind of see what to do there. Also, if you want to pick up this book, I'd highly recommend getting it in hard copy form. You can find the link to the Amazon page where you can pick it up um, or you can pick it up on audiobook as well. Uh, if you click through my link there, you will um, support the podcast and it doesn't cost you anything extra, but Amazon will give me a few pennies for sending you over there to get it. So that would really help out as well. I really appreciate you guys. Thank you so much. I'm going to leave you now with a parting thought and I wanted to kind of keep in touch with what I was talking about kind of towards the end of the things that I didn't like section. So <clears throat> here we go. This is from Marcus Aurelius, uh, in meditations. It's a stoic philosophy and it's one that I really like, but Without further ado, Marcus Aurelius, quote, everything we hear is an opinion, not a fact. Everything we see is a perspective, not the truth, end quote. And I think that little quote speaks for itself, right? Um, if you hear someone else talking, that is their opinion. And that is their opinion based off of, you know, varying levels of expertise and experience, um, but not necessarily uh, the correct, you know, God's honest truth. And, um, everything that you see from your perspective is by its inherent nature, your perspective. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's the whole truth. There is truth out there. There are facts out there, but they don't come easy. And so I think our natural, uh, inclination should be to assume that, uh, if it came easy or if we just heard it from somebody else, maybe we should do a little bit um, more reflection, a little bit digger deeping, uh, <laughs> a little bit of deeper digging to uh, find that truth that is out there. And those facts that are out there, they don't come easy. They don't come cheap. If you want them, you got to go get them. You got to get after them. I appreciate you guys. Thank you so much for listening. Have a good day. Goodbye. Goodbye.